Cool. So um, I'm David. Um, I work at a company called Tanda, uh, writing a lot of React and Redux-based code. Um, I am woefully underprepared for this. I have had a massive amount of unity to do. So this has been thrown together in like maybe an hour, probably less. It's a pretty nice tradition. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is Redux, which is a state management system. What have I got written here? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's just a simple state management library. Um, it's nothing more than that. Um, it's a place to maintain the current data that your app knows about. And a lot of its popularity, I think, comes from the fact that it is such a simple uh, concept. Um, it can be a little hard to wrap your head around when you first start playing with it. Um, and it took me longer than I'd like to admit. But it's a super powerful concept when you know how it works. Um, it's completely framework agnostic, but the core Redux community seems to be really around uh, React. And Redux itself is based on Flux, which is by Facebook. Uh, for state management in, Re uh, in React. So it's kind of purpose designed for that. Um, but there are clo clones for all the other frameworks. So uh, Vue has a recommended version. Their state recommended state management is called Vuex. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, so yeah. But there's nothing about Redux that's really JavaScript either. It could be uh, implemented in pretty much any language. Uh, it works through the concept of a reducer. Uh, it accepts the current state and some data, and it gives you back a new state. Um, I guess probably a lot of you know what a reducer is, but for those who don't, how, how many don't know what a reducer is? Okay, one or two, okay. Um, real quick, uh, a reducer just takes in uh, some input and, and a current state and returns you some new state. Um, so in this example here, uh, we use it in arrays a lot. So it takes in the two arguments, which is the accumulator and the current item. Um, we, in this case, add the two together and then return a new one. And then in the next time around, accumulator will be the result of this. So this at the start will be zero. And then current will be what, like this one now. Um, you'll add them together and return one in this case. Now accumulator will be one, current will be two. Add them together, go back. I think I cover this. Um, how do I? Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. So that's how a reducer works. Um, that's probably a terrible explanation, but it's it's pretty much a, a way to take a group of items and flatten it down to a single item. Um, what do we got next? So reducers themselves. So the reducer in this particular case is this function here. Um, uh, so how do how do we apply it to to state management? Um, it doesn't need to be passed in as an argument. We can use it as a separate function. Um, so in, this, in pretty much all the examples, we're going to be working with a fruit shop. Um, and it's going to keep track of how many items have been bought. Uh, the reducer is going to accept some kind of state as the first argument, um, which we will initialize to an empty object if it doesn't exist. And it's going to take in some data, which will be a string, which is the type of fruit that has been bought. Um, so we're going to say, if the data is an apple, and um, we'll return, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but we'll return the, the existing state, but we'll increment the counter for Apple. Um, so it's a brand new object, it doesn't mutate the existing object, it is, like, doesn't keep the reference at all, it will get garbage collected eventually. Um, we only sell apples here, so if we're not selling an apple, we will just return the state. That's pretty much the core premise of Redux. It's a few extra things which make it nice, but at the end of the day, that's mostly what Redux is. Um, so actions are the next like core premise of Redux. Um, actions are just a JavaScript object, and the only requirement is that it has a type, uh, which helps you in define the, uh, the action to the reducer. So essentially, an action is just a way to uh, describe to the reducer what you're going to change. Um, uh, yeah, you just give it some amount of data and then it, it tells the reducer how it's going to change. Uh, we've covered reducers a lot. Um, the only thing I want to stress is never mutate the state, always return a new object. So here we always return a, a new object, um, we never mutate it. Um, state is just the thing we get back from the reducer, it's generally an object in a normal application. Alright, let's take a closer look. Actions, these are some actions. Um, 
It's just a plain JavaScript object. It must contain type as a minimum, but other than that, there's no rules. Um, as you can see from this short example, writing out every action could get tedious, so we generally use an action creator. Uh, instead of writing out add one apple and add two apples, we can uh, make a function that returns to us uh, another object, which tells the reducer how many apples we bought. Um, this lets us generate uh, an arbitrary action for how many apples have been bought. And um, yeah, cool. This is what our reducer looked like before. Um, and as you start to add more stuff, you get a whole bunch of if statements, which is kind of gross. Um, so this is what, it's not that much less gross, but pretty much in Redux, everyone just uses a switch statement. Um, switch on your action type, and if it is the type of apple, do a certain thing, and then return the new state from there. Um, it could probably be condensed, but don't get too clever. You might understand your, tri your tricks now, but someone else might not, which makes it really hard to maintain in the future. Like you in the future. Yeah, definitely me in the future. I've done this too many times. All right, so this is where Redux kind of differs from just being a simple reducer. Um, not too much, and it's kind of still really nice to reason about. Um, actions are dispatched to the store by calling store.dispatch. Um, we make this, yeah, so we just dispatch our normal action, um, and then we can just replace that with our little action creator we made before. Actions are then sent to the reducer, and the subscribers are notified. Oh, God. Uh, yeah, so you send an action to the reducer, and then the reducer does something, um, and then the store lets the person know that something has been done. Um, you shouldn't really be using subscribe directly in your application. There's a whole bunch of nice wrappers around them. Um, cool, cool. If you're using Redux with a library, you'll probably find a nice subscribe wrapper. So React Redux for React, obviously. Why do we do this? Um, it's just like a conventional database. It lets us keep all of our state in one place. The recommended concept is to just have one data store. Um, it provides some really cool features that allow you to build up larger data sets by combining like lower level reducers, so it's not just one big mess of fruit names. Um, this makes your application super easy to reason about um, because it all flows in one direction. So it always goes, your application will send out an action, the reducer will take in the action and give some new state back, and then when the state gets updated, it'll let the application know, so it's like a big, big circle. Um, Makes your application super easy to reason about. All your data is coming from a predictable location, um, so you can kind of find it easily when you uh, when data goes bad. Um, yeah, so you don't have to store your state in a DOM anymore, which I mean I hope no one is still doing because it is very hard to, to maintain. And the t determinism based on reducers being like these pure things that always return a new function and don't really do anything outside of that um, makes your application super easy to reason about. You should try and avoid side effects at all costs. Um, so make sure that every time you call your reducer, no matter what you call it with, like if you call it with the same thing a thousand times, you should get back the same result a thousand times. Um, the benefits that it provide are super awesome. I pretty much changed the way I do development. Here's a real quick thing I want to do just to see uh, how it goes. Um, kind of to demonstrate one of the things I like most about Redux. So if everyone can pick a four digit number, something that you might remember in a minute's time, uh, multiply that number by three, and then divide it by two, and then finally add one to it. Uh, and I mean, if you give it a minute, what it's it's hard to remember what your result was. Uh, you kind of you can remember your first number. Uh, you can remember that like the, the final state, the final state after doing all those operations, is kind of hard to remember. But you can probably remember what your what your what you started with. You can probably remember what you did to it. It wasn't that complex a set of operations. So without like, oh, where am I? Hold on. Yeah. So you can you can tell me what operations you apply to get your result, and if you apply them again, you'll get the same result out at the other end. Um, and that's one of the guiding principles of of Redux. Your initial state plus a sequence of operations will always get you to the same final state, no matter how many times you do it. Um, that's providing your reducers are pure, but please do that. <laughs> 
This is cool for a couple of reasons. So, so four digits is kind of easy, like you probably remember the final result. But if you take a 32-digit number and do the same thing to it, it's going to get a lot more difficult to try and remember the end result of that. Um, but remembering the initial 32-digit number is not that easy to start with. There are two more things that it provides us. And I didn't really get time to do slides for these, but I did do a real quick cheeky code demo. Um, so well, let's, let's see how this goes, because I haven't tested this in any way. Um, let me change. Cool. Oh, awesome. We're good, we're good. All right, cool. Um, so pretty much what I've got here is I've built a super simple uh, application with Redux. We have this cool web page. Can, can we see this? see this text? Do I need to make it bigger or probably get rid of this to be honest? Um, awesome. So we have this little fruit shop application um, that we've added Redux to. So this is completely framework agnostic. This just uses general DOM. Um, so we've got a couple of actions we can do here. We can set somebody's name. We can add a banana to the cart. We can add an apple. And um, we can toggle whether the fruit shop is open or closed. Um, and then if we're not doing any of those things, we're just going to return the state. Um, constants are a thing I really like to do. It makes it easy to uh, get errors from your IDE when you, or text editor, whatever you want to call it, when you uh, make a mistake. Um, so spelling errors, you kind of lose being able to do that. These are our actions, super simple. Um, these two we've seen before, they're really, really nice and easy. Actions don't have to return any kind of thing. I return payload most of the time, but this one just tells the reducer to toggle the fruit shop, so it doesn't really need to know anything more about it. Um, and then we're going to set our name, and this is our default name. So we can, you can pretty much put whatever you like into a reducer. Um, and these two things are just like super simple little examples that I made to make this thing actually boot. All right, so let me just, um, this is really quite difficult. Uh, that's the wrong one. Cool. So we have our fruit shop here. Um, we have also, so pretty much all of these actions that I made, I have added to the window so we can call them easily. It will dispatch them. Um, that's what this thing here does. One of these things wraps all the actions so that they can be put on the window. We can just call them ourselves. Um, and then this is where things get really awesome. Redux DevTools are like a god thing. Um, so this shows, can, can we see that? I can't see that. I don't know if I can do that in. Yeah, awesome. Um, so this shows the current state of our application. Um, the content is hello world. The fruit shop is currently closed. We have sold zero apples and zero bananas. Let's um, start with um, opening the fruit shop. Cool. So we have opened the fruit shop, and you can see that we have an action here that I've dispatched, toggles the fruit shop on and off, and the fruit shop is now set to true. So this is where it comes in where you like try to remember the numbers from before. If we go back to here and skip this action, it has never happened, and your application is in whatever state it was in before. Um, put it back on, we're good. Uh, let's add an apple, and we'll add like eight apples. We now have eight apples. If we skip that, the apples are still there. We can still see that the state 
the current state of the application is eight apples, but the fruit shop is like not there anymore. Um, so let's put him back on. Uh, set name to let's go for his JS. Cool. Um, and, and the DOM updates are all just being done by the subscribe function, so it's not like listening or polling or anything. It's just on the subscribe function. Um, awesome. So let me just add a couple more things. So now we're in some kind of deep nested application state. Um, we can make the fruit shop go away and then come back and then go away. So now we're like, the application's been running for a while. We have a bunch of actions here. Um, now what we can do that is like, being able to see what actions you've dispatched and have them describe your state perfectly is awesome. Um, the other cool thing is that because our application, I really hope this works. Um, but we'll do we'll do time traveling first. So time traveling will allow us to scrub back to any point in the application's history and see what it looked like at that point in time. So all our actions are down here are now skipped, and as we go back in time, we can see exactly what the user did and play them through at like this ridiculously slow speed and see what actually happened in our application. Cool. Awesome. Okay, what else is really cool? That because our state completely describes our entire application, um, we can keep it, and then when the user comes back, they can get back to exactly where they were before. Um, so in local storage here, you can see this, oh wow, none of those, uh, state, cool. Um, so content, fruit shop, bananas, apples. So now when we refresh, the application comes back to exactly where it was. Um, and if I do local storage dot clear, will clear do everything? Yeah, cool. Now we're back at the initial application state. So your application state describing your entire, the entirety of how your application should look is super powerful. Um, it makes bugs a lot easier to find. It makes your application a lot easier to reason about. And you can test each of those actions and make sure that like, when you apply an action, you get a specific result back. Um, that's pretty much all I want to cover. Um, yeah, cool. Questions? Yeah. You're talking about uh, keeping the reducers as pure as possible. Yeah. Obviously, at some point, you might want to do validation. You would do that. Where would you do that? I, I literally, so this reducer looks really simple. If you looked at any of my application code, my reducer might have a few more rows to it. And it's like, but that's what my reducers look like. They, Where would you do validation? I do all my validation in actions, in actions. Um, which I don't know if is the correct pattern, but I'd like to do it early before putting the bad data in a reducer. So in here, if we had some guy who was like, um, we could do like if uh, count less than zero, we could return some other action here that was like, um, don't, true. So like, in that case, this one will be a hit. You don't have to worry about it. Um, if you put it into your reducer and then are like, oh, actually, is my reducer still in the correct state? Like, if you refresh at that point, or if you try and figure out what your application looked like at that point, it makes it a lot more difficult, in, in my opinion, anyway. You want to keep the reducers as simple as clean as possible? Yeah. In, like, the way I use a reducer is literally just, it takes in a payload, does very little to it, and puts it on the state. And uh, regarding saving to localize, that's something you did Oh, yeah, so this literally is, this is a very bad application. There's a little function that is called update page. We call it once on boot, um, and then every time we go through, we get the state back from the, uh, the store. Um, if the fruit shop is there, we like get rid of the style, otherwise we hide it, and we update it. So, and then every time you make a change, it literally just um, serializes your store and puts it in local storage. And then on boot, um, our reducer will Yet from, I can't remember where I've done it, but some, so local storage, let's say, if, if state exists, it'll put that in, otherwise it'll start with nothing. 
the point of this wasn't like real quick, sorry. The point of this wasn't really to teach people how this works, but kind of to get them more excited about it so that they will go out and learn themselves. 20 minutes is really enough to, to learn Redux. But I hope that it has like inspired some people to take a closer look at a really nice way to handle your state. Awesome. Cool. More questions? Yeah. Yep. How, how do you feel about um, something like this that fits into the JavaScript ecosystem fairly well versus uh, something like Elm, which attempts to be its own thing that sits into the JavaScript? So Doesn't really fade me. As far as I know, Elm implements, somebody can definitely correct me if I'm wrong, but Elm implements a fairly similar architecture to handle yeah. state. So that's, yeah. that's what I mean. Redux is, yeah, I mean, it, I think it stemmed from the Elm state management. So Redux is not really JavaScript specific. Um, it's, you can implement it in any language, and I, just, I don't really mind. Write what makes it happy. Um, like everything. Write it well. Doing in JavaScript makes it better. Cool. That's a big call. <laughs> no, right? Almost certainly the wrong call. <laughs> <coughs> Nothing else? Yeah. yeah. The, um, you said earlier the, the reducers in that large switch thing. Yep. Oh, you're talking about much. In a more complex app, are we talking about tens or hundreds of entries here? Or so I've kind of really oversimplified this. You would have multiple reducers. So think of a reducer as, uh, I, I don't want to say, but more or less like a table in your database. And then you have a bunch of tables that make up your application state. So you might have um, a bunch of reducers that all then combine together into a top level reducer. And this is where Redux provides some nice tools so you can like access your state all the way down. So if you had like fruit and also cars that you were both selling, you would have a fruit reducer and a car reducer. And then from the top application state, you can do like state.cars or state.fruit and then access those reducers inside there. All right. Yeah, yeah. Instead of using a switch, why don't you just check them out on an object and rest them on key? Uh, you, you can do that. I like the switches. It makes it semantic. In, yeah, again, my opinion, but like, you can, so you could use an if statement. You could probably like go do a for loop over every letter in the type and define, determine where you want to go from there. Um, just do what makes you happy. Awesome. Thanks a lot. <laughs>